<laughs> Sorry about that. We were trying to get the, um, we're sharing the, the presentation with some fellow OPIers. But we'll get started now. Um, welcome, I'm on, yeah. Welcome to uh, my talk. I'm David Norton. I'm an engineer here at OPI. Um, I've been here for about four years and uh, I've been helping out the same uh, e-commerce client, help, helping them uh, transform their platform. And uh, I'm gonna talk about continuous delivery today um, and what continuous delivery means to me uh, and, <laughs> and how, how you can uh, help achieve uh, some continuous delivery goals uh, using Gradle. Um, uh, some of my experience using uh, using these practices. Uh, the client I'm at when when I started, they just moved from quarter quarterly releases to monthly releases, uh, and they were they had it required about uh, 250 people on site overnight for this monolithic application deploy. I don't know if that sounds familiar to any of you, but uh, now now we've got a much more modularized uh, system and. Most applications deploy weekly um, during the day with without uh, without um, you know anybody really paying attention. Uh, just kind of it, it happens, and uh, and then uh, the the application. One of the applications I'm working on, uh, we're going to kind of spearhead for moving to daily deployments and potentially more often or more of a uh, uh, decouple decouple our releases or deployments from a from a calendar model. Um, so uh, that's where I'm coming from, um, but I'll dispense with the pleasantries because I'm here to put you back on schedule. Timely Star Wars reference. Um, <laughs> but what is, what is continuous delivery? Um, I think uh, a lot of people use this term um, and uh, it probably means different things to different people. Um, but uh, we, in answering that question, um, you might want to ask ourselves some questions about why, why do we want to do continuous delivery? Is it, uh, is it something that's going to add value or is it just going to, uh, to get in the way and cause a lot of noise? Um, so these questions I, I, I would like to ask are um, related to uh, to delivering value to your customers. So if your product managers want to add a feature, um, most of the time development doesn't actually take that long, right? We're, we're, uh, with frameworks today, we're able to develop things pretty quickly, but, uh, but it's maybe that overall process of getting it in front of users and testing that, especially with lean MVP product uh, development. Um, they like to test a, use, test a feature and then maybe yank it out or change it. Um, so what's that cycle time for how quickly we can get it in front of them? And then it may be a small change, but how confident are we that there, nothing else was broken, um, that we didn't uh, accidentally see some, break something else? Um, and especially as the application, uh, as the system grows, uh, that becomes more important um, that, you, uh, that you have those, uh, that automated regression. Um, and if you have an infrastructure change, uh, how confident are you in, in that change? Um, you know, for example, moving from Java 7 to Java 8 or from a, uh, from a uh, virtual machine to a Docker container um, infrastructure, so, something, something along those lines. Um, and then another thing I like to think about is if, if this is a, an application that maybe you don't touch every day or if, uh, if there's a new developer on the team, um, how quickly are they able to check out the the project, uh, check out the repository, and and get things going, and become and have have a stable development environment, and and feel pretty good that when they make changes, that they uh, that it uh, is that they're not going to break anything. <laughs> um, so continuous delivery is actually the first principle uh, in the Agile manifesto. Um, if you look at the 12 principles of Agile software on, on the Agile Manifesto. The first one is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Um, I, uh, that that's, says to me that it's a pretty important part of Agile 
And, and to me, actually, the more I think about continuous delivery, the more I think it really is just agile done right. Uh, I, re- I heard on uh, software engineering radio, uh, this podcast, um, that 90% or more of projects these days call themselves agile projects. And I, I think that's pretty laughable, probably. Um, and they may be agile in that they have a, a whiteboard with index cards on it and they stand up every day at 9 a.m. Um, but it's not a, it, it, they're not really thinking uh, in, in the agile mindset. Um, and that's kind of, that, I don't think that's a new problem. Um, you know, uh, when Toyota was developing the lean production system, they openly shared their principle, their practices with everybody Um, because they knew that the practices were only part of it you know you can you can put cards on the board but you really have to understand the thought process and um, and uh, and integrate that thought process and then you make your own decisions about how you're going to do continuous delivery or how you're going to do agile Uh, so continuous delivery is not cowboy coding in production Uh, I've worked on uh, I worked on projects where it's a cold fusion server and you know there you're just modifying files and in, in the production and I've had to uh, had to slap that down um, especially you know you see index.cfm index.cfm dot backup index.cfm dot 2012 you know um, that that sort of deals but this is not and I still see cowboy coding in production today actually uh, in in terms of um, yeah, front end. Uh, some t- sometimes there will be a kind of a last uh, last chance global JavaScript file that can override anything in the site, uh, and, and so we, we try to. We're always trying to avoid that. Um, and continuous delivery is not quite continuous deployment. Um, I, the uh, and and we'll get to exactly how those are different, but. Uh, Martin Fowler said that continuous delivery is a software development discipline where you build software in such a way that the software can be released to production at any time. So um, really the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment, I think, is that um, continuous deployment could go or it, uh, it, it will go to production as soon as you make that commit to master or commit to trunk. Um, but continuous delivery, it may use continuous deployment to a point in your pipeline, but it's not. Uh, it, it, you may not have that um, that last step to production or um, uh, there. You, you more have a, a, a model where every change you make to your source your source control is stable enough that uh, that it could go to production um, when you're ready. Um, and uh, and there there may things be things you can't automate. There may be there may be steps in your uh, uh, in your company's um, process that they refuse to uh, automate, or there may be a good reason um, not to automate. It may be a a uh, a you know a, a user experience kind of review or something like that. Um, and so so you'll have that kind of manual check, but you try to automate everything else. Um, and some things really don't work work well for continuous deployments. And I'm thinking, uh, I know like native apps are pretty difficult to get into the to the app store. Sometimes uh, users don't like to download a new app every day or multiple times a day, um, and you can't deploy firmware um, to uh, remote uh, robots uh, out in the world every day, um, or maybe maybe you can, but it's usually not um, commonplace. And then uh, even like open source libraries, you may not want to cut a new release of your of your framework or your your library um, with with every commit because it, it may just confuse uh, confuse your uh, your users and you know add add a lot of noise to to it. But the um, so you may not do it on every commit, but you can, you could you have that option. That's um, hey, we have a critical fix. We need to we need to get this released. You have a high high level of confidence that you're able to to release that. 
I, I kind of think of it as um, if you've ever been to Fogo de Chao or uh, down, downtown, uh, they, they just make a ton of meat and they just bring you, they bring you the steak and you've got a little card and you, you know, it's green. You know, yes, bring me the, bring me the meat. And if you turn it to red, uh, you know, you could stop it. Um, and, and, uh, I think if, if your app is, um, even if your app is on a continuous deployment all the way to production kind of model, you, you would probably still have some sort of, um, some sort of card or lever that you could switch to say, hey, we're going through a production event right now. We're, we're under a DDoS attack or we're, you know, maybe it's a important holiday, um, you know, for, or an important uh, time for your business and you don't want to risk, risk anything. So you might turn it to red and just pause, pause deployments for a while. So, um, so yeah, we'll talk about uh, pipelines. Um, everybody's gonna have a different pipeline to get to production um, and I think most most teams do have a pipeline already even if it's not uh, not uh, automated very well um, but uh, no matter how you structure you, your your process your pipeline um, the sooner you you catch the problem the, the easier it is to fix it so it's obviously easier to catch it if the or to fix a bug, if my IDE tell gives me a little red line that I didn't, you know, import a class or something, um, uh, and and so on. If 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 my build catches it before I commit, then that's an even you know another uh, good place to to catch a problem. Um, if if you commit, make a change and commit it, and two weeks later, uh, QA team comes back and says, "Hey, we found this bug." You have no idea where that bug came from, or you know. Your, your mind has already moved on to other things and then you have to kind of go back and piece it together and figure out how you fix that. And then probably you have to run, rerun regression tests uh, all over again. Um, so it might look something like this, that you've got a, uh, a commit phase where, where you build, um, you build and you run unit tests and then you deploy to a lower environment um, or an integration environment um, and then you maybe run some sort of validation in, the, in that environment and then uh, and then you maybe would deploy to production um, And I'm, I'm just going to uh, that's all on the developer machine where they make a change um, and, and they, they can follow the TDD style there um, where the red green refact refactor and then uh, when they think they're good they they run the build uh, that runs the unit test it you know has a has a tested artifact um, everything seems good the, the uh, developer commits um, and then it goes off to and runs the same build you know in a, in a CI server uh, and and that build produces an artifact that then you have this you have this artifact that can be deployed to environments or um, or deploy have tests run against it um, or whatnot um, and then uh, at the very end after all those verifications have passed you've got the verified build and that can go to, go to production um, and everybody's going to have their own uh, their own pipeline there's going to be different use cases that you need to test test against different ways that you've been burned um, and uh, and there's always there's always going to be more more tests you can write I don't I don't think um, with, with the nature of uh, of today's uh, you know browsers always changing or um, systems underneath always changing I think there's you could always improve your automated testing strategy um, and uh, and 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 add more checks. So it's really about having a, a pretty high level of confidence that you are that you've got this uh, that you've got this uh, artifact that's good and, and and well tested. And then you get it to production, and maybe something an edge case that you didn't foresee will, will uh, cause you to need to make another change, make make a change. Then you'd write a test for it and get that in there. Um, 
and uh, and the, you know there's the old agile um, uh, quote uh, if it hurts do it more often and so the more the more automated the more the more you repeat this uh, process the easier it is to get get the build out uh, in, in a repeatable way and if you do make a mistake you can fix it in a pretty repeatable way and there's there's a lot that so I'm going to be talking about this left hand side or, or up to up to the build point today with with Gradle um, there there's a, a lot that you can talk about with continuous delivery as far as um, deployment and uh, and uh, active passive load balancers and uh, and feature flags um, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 infrastructure automation um, obviously that you could you could have whole conferences about that and not be done talking about it. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just try to stick to the build phase here about how you how you have a commit um, and source control and you're able to uh, to have that repeatable build that artifact that comes out of there. Um, so you've got these tools. This is a, a diagram from my colleague uh, John Engelman. Um, you've got these pieces of your system. Uh, that uh, all kind of intersect and so you've, you've got your application and your infrastructure and, and your tests or your, your verifications um, of, of those uh, and, and the and they intersect in different ways that um, that uh, uh, that when you <laughs> I'm not doing a good job explaining this but um, you you need you need a, a, a solid application a solid infrastructure and solid tests to get to continuous delivery. Um, you can have continuous deployment, but without testing, um, you don't really know. You know, it, it may not be, uh, it, it may not be very uh, reliable. Um, and you can have, uh, you, you can kind of work on your infrastructure um, and and automation there, and that's the infrastructure is code. Um, so you, you, you want to automate um, as much as possible of your pipeline and I think um, it, this is a baby steps process uh, we're, you're not gonna uh, have you're not gonna be perfectly done with continuous delivery uh, the first day or ever you're probably always gonna find new ways to improve your your process just like agile um, you're never gonna be done iterating on your your agile process you're never gonna be done uh, finding better ways to produce reliable software. Um, so, so you automate as much as possible, but obviously there may be some manual validation or approvals, and that's okay. Um, and the concept of the pipeline is that you have you you define these you define these um, steps that need to occur, and you you deploy or you, you perform those steps, and then along the way there's various checkpoints that. Um, that uh, that uh, that allow it to go further. So um, your build may fail, and it's not going to allow it to go any further. Or some of these other verifications may fail, and it's not going to allow it to go to production if the other verifications fail. Um, uh, and and so you really have to design your pipeline to match what you value, what you think are the biggest the biggest risks, and. Uh, and then I, I would challenge you, notice I don't have a staging environment here. I think most, you know, maybe that could be part of the other verifications or maybe, um, maybe you would put that just before production. Um, it doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter. A lot of people have, um, have environments just because they need, you know, they think they need another place to deploy it. Um, and I would, I would challenge you to, uh, to make your um, make make your environments fit around your pipeline, if if you have that opportunity, rather than uh, rather than making your pipeline fit around some sort of preconceived notion of of environments, but you may not have that be able to make that decision. <laughs> and then that kind of ties in then with works on my machine. Um, we we've all seen this, and there's lots of ways to uh, to reduce the impact um, uh, of of differences between local and production, um, and especially now with a 
especially now with uh, Docker and uh, and Vagrant or or what have you. You can you can make your local your local build your local environment look a lot like uh, production. Um, and I think we are always finding new ways to make it look more like production. But there's some things you're just never go going to you're never going to have it, have it be exactly the same. Uh, for example, I was writing a Google App Engine the other uh, app the other day, and um, that's very specific. It's got a very specific uh, environment that it runs in. There's certain APIs that are allowed and certain ones that aren't. And so um, I had a staging environment uh, because I I wanted to make sure that I could deploy out there, and uh, and and that all my tests would run uh, would run there as well. So. Uh, Another thing here is uh, is that most of us aren't uh, we don't get to make all the decisions. We work in a large organization or um, or, or whatnot, uh, and that's fine. Um, I think uh, I don't know if you guys can read that, but Dilbert's saying the goal of every engineer is to retire without getting blamed for a major catastrophe, um, <laughs> and that's uh, that's a worthy goal. Um, but you can't you can't control uh, every, everything, um, and so you're going to have to kind of uh, you're going to have to fit your your delivery pipeline in with what the organization may require. Um, but the good thing is is that we're moving more and more of the verification into the build phase, um, into uh, into uh, local container environments. Um, and so we can we can really do a lot there to make sure that our application is well improved, is well well uh, tested and uh, and solid. And um, at the end, you'll you know other people will see what you're doing and really want to do it as well. Do we have um, do we have a lot of big people working for big companies here? Uh, Mostly under under ten people, or no? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, kind of key to this continuous delivery uh, is source control. Um, if if we kind of go back, uh, we can release to production at any time. Um, so this is a a uh, a. A requirement that says everything we have uh, need to build a project is in source control, or we can get it in a retrievable way, a reputable way. Um, so we we obviously keep our source in source control, but we also uh, we also keep our build scripts in source control. Um, maybe we maybe we if we're using continuous integration, we um, uh, like Jenkins, we find a way to keep the Jenkins config um, in source control. And then, um, and then uh, you you have a README it tells you how to build build the um, project, and uh, and you go from there. Um, so so kind of the uh, the thing about uh, master based development is that you'll probably want to avoid long lived feature branches, um, which would mean kind of avoiding the Git flow model. And that does, that's not for everybody, um, but I found it's worked pretty well uh, for us uh, to to keep everything on master. We'll have short short-lived feature branches. We'll we'll kind of uh, we'll kind of do you know um, uh, like we'll try things out on a branch and whatnot. But if you have a long-lived feature branch, the longer the longer that two branches are separated from master, even if they're merging from master into their feature branch, the more the two branches are gonna, um, are gonna uh, differ. And then eventually someone's gonna win merging back into master and, and the other person's gonna be stuck cleaning up the mess. So what really works uh, better for me is, um, is separating the deployment from the release with feature flags. So you might, if you have like a new feature that kind of needs to bake for a while and UX needs to kind of get in there and validate certain things, um, you can write this new feature in, uh, in your code and commit it to master, but you have a, basically a Boolean configuration value. 
that you can turn it on or, on or off at runtime. And then you write tests that test it with the value on and with the value off. Excuse me. Um, and so that gives you the, uh, the, and then you can maybe like deploy that, um, deploy that uh, from master, but with that feature flag on and some sort of testing environment for, for a, the UX person to try out. Um, uh, but it allows you to develop uh, new features kind of in, in isolation from users, but you're still in, in integrating with the other developers. And that's really kind of continuous integration at its core. It's continuous integration is not really Jenkins or, you know, I'm going to build my, you know, my project on a, on a server somewhere. Continuous integration is you're integrating with the other developers uh, regularly. Um, and then another thing that you might have to do, a lot of things, uh, some, something that people use uh, feature branches for are where they're like rewriting, they're re-implementing something with a different, you know, a different backend or whatnot. Um, and so there's a strategy there called branch by abstraction where you might abstract your, uh, abstract your class behind an interface or your, your implementation and then you'd write the new implementation and kind of like a feature flag you would have a, at runtime you kind of decide, yeah, I'm going to include this new implementation and you run your, you, you test that and so it's well tested and then at some point you just kind of switch over and you kill off the old one. Um, but uh, that's another way to kind of have these long running, these long running uh, uh, changes um, integrated regularly. <clears throat> um, and then you might have release branches still, um, especially if you, you know, you, you may not be deploying every day, you might not, you know, or every week or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you, uh, when you do have something that probably has to get fixed in production uh, pretty quickly, maybe there's a a legal requirement change, or maybe there is a bug that got that got noticed, or uh, what, what, whatever. Um, you you can you know uh, branch off that release and uh, that release tag, and build, you know make your change, write a test, and uh, and push that build through the pipeline. Um, but it's really not. It becomes a lot less important the closer your master branch is to production. Um, so that kind of brings us to uh, item potent builds. Um, for a given commit, uh, for, for your input, you, you have the ability to rebuild the same artifact um, and get the same output. And uh, that's obviously like an, another Star Wars reference uh, where we got all the clone troopers from Django Fett. Um, but the... Uh, the, the main thing here is finding all the things that could um, that could differ between uh, building my uh, building my project today versus building it a week from now or a month from now or building it on someone some other developer's computer and eliminating those differences as much as possible and getting that all into source control so that you've got a, a solid base to to start from does anybody have any questions on all that Great. Feel free, by the way, to interrupt me if you, anybody has any questions. Um, so I think we're all uh, familiar with a, a basic build phase. Um, when I my first my first job uh, was the build phase was going to the file menu and export you know export web app and. Um, and that had differing results, obviously, based on how your IDE was configured and was not a very uh, reliable way to produce an artifact for, for release. Um, so the uh, so basic build phase is you'll download dependencies, compile, you'll run some maybe unit test and integration tests, um, you'll package it up, you'll, you'll probably run some functional tests, like, on, from the outside, like maybe over, you know, if, if your application is an API or a web app, you, rather than rather than calling the Java methods or the, or the, the controller methods using a unit test, you you make an HTTP call to your application, um, some sort of test like that uh, against a running application, 
And then if all those tests pass and any other verifications or anything else you want to throw in that build pass, then you can, uh, you've got the artifact and you can archive that. So with Gradle, um, with the dependencies, uh, really a key here is avoiding the snapshot dependencies on, on other pro uh, projects in your ecosystem um, or, or open-ended dependencies where you say, I need, uh, I need this at least version 2.1 of this library or the latest version of this library or some range because um, you'll get different results depending on where you run it or when you run it. Um, and uh, it's, it's not always that easy. Sometimes you have a dependency on another library uh, within your, your organization that, you know, well, we need the latest uh, snapshot because we're modifying both pretty quickly. Um, but that's where it may make sense to rethink about whether you, why, why you have separate build and release processes for those two things that seem so interconnected that you have to have a snapshot dependency. Um, so maybe, maybe you could bring the two, the two projects into be sub, separate modules of the same, of the same uh, build process and you version them together. Or maybe you have, uh, maybe you just make it, make it a non snapshot dependency. And when you have a new feature in this common library, you, uh, that you need in the new one, you, you, uh, you update your, your application. Um, if you use a URL to load a dependency, you have to be pretty sure that that content's not going to change. Um, and I'll get to an example of that here. And, uh, it's and not just for libraries. Think about build tool, your build tool and your plugins too. So with Gradle, we want to make sure that we're using the right version of Gradle. Um, if plugin dependencies in Gradle, the core plugins like Java and Groovy and WAR are, uh, they're versioned with Gradle. So the version of the Groovy plugin that you're using is going to be based on whatever version of Gradle you're running. Um, so we use the Gradle wrapper uh, to, to, uh, to build our application. And that's just a, a simple a script that will download, download Gradle and run, it, run the correct version for you. So you get to commit into your source repository. I'm using Gradle 2.8 or 2.10 or whatever. And, and that Gradle wrapper will download the right version. And that's actually one of my favorite things about Gradle. Uh, they've, they've opened it up. That somebody's created a Maven wrapper as well. But I don't have to install Gradle anywhere. I, last time, the only time I need to install Gradle is to, uh, is to in, initialize a new Gradle project. Uh, and so sometimes I'll have to, uh, you know, I'm starting a new project. I'll have to go download SDK Man or something so I can install Gradle. Uh, because most of the time I'm just running the Gradle wrapper. Um, it means I don't have to install Gradle on uh, my Jenkins uh, instance or make sure that it's the right version. Um, and in, uh, <clears throat> in today's world, I think a lot, of, a lot of teams have multiple applications that they maintain. Um, and if you don't have to worry about keeping every application on the right version of Gradle, or, uh, or making sure the developers have the right version of Gradle installed, um, it's, a big, it's a big benefit to just be able to say, oh, you just run Gradle, Gradle W, and, uh, and it will run it for you. Um, and it will download the right version. Um, another thing with uh, shared build logic, which is just another, <clears throat> another way of uh, running the Gradle, or of, uh, of including a Gradle plugin, um, a lot of the time, uh, an organization will have a shared Gradle uh, file that will be used. Um, it's uh, and it's it's just a Gradle plugin essentially, but a, a build script that defines that you know here here are my artifact repositories. Here's my um, here's some common plugins or something. Uh, whatever whatever people use, uh, that's great. But just make sure you version that as well. Um, whether it's a whether it's a build.gradle file that it's loading over HTTP or whether it's packaged as a jar um, and put in. Uh, the nice thing, if you put it in Nexus or Artifactory, it will probably enforce some sort of versioning for you. So you should be good there. But just another way that you can, you could potentially introduce some unreliability. Um, 
with Gradle, I, I think most of the time you're not really going to get different results when you're compiling. The main thing I want to point out is that the default values of source of source and target are based on the version of the JVM that you're running on. Um, and so you may want to set that to whatever version you're targeting uh, in case in case you upgrade at some point in the future. Um, and, and that's probably a good uh, lesson for any time you run, anytime you're looking at the Gradle docs and it says it's defaulted to something based on your system, think about that as a potential risk as far as uh, a, a non-repeatable build. And so testing, this isn't, uh, this isn't really a testing talk, but I don't think you can really have a reliable build without some sort of testing. So I'm just going to um, do a quick overview of some testing you might run. Um, you, usually, most people know how to write a unit test where they, they test a single class and they mock out or they stub out the dependent classes that that class depends on. Um, an integration test is usually starting up like your application framework and asserting that basically that you uh, configured your application correctly in the way you expect so that certain property values are there or whatever you might you might use those integration tests to kind of test some uh, some database uh, calls and make sure you got those queries correct correct um, but you still would probably mock or stub some third-party services um, and then the functional testing um, you would uh, test your application running on an app server local, locally. Uh, you test your APIs and your UI if it's all packaged together in one app. And it's kind of more written more like an acceptance test. So you're, as you kind of peel back the layers of the onion um, and you get, to the, you get to the core of the logic you're testing, you have much more detailed logic in your unit tests and you test as many cases as possible. But as you get to the larger, uh, the outside-in testing, you probably can't test every edge case, nor should you. But you should at least have a um, a test harness where you where you can uh, where you can start up this this server and run these tests. Um, and then you'd write the test kind of like an ex uh, the acceptance criteria on your on your story. But you know, when I'm a user and I log in, then I can go through this and follow some sort of script. Um, and so, uh, and then you need to, with that, you need to isolate the build uh, into a repeatable environment. So you don't really want to use a shared database. You'd want to um, either use an in-memory database um, or throw your database into a Docker container and start that up as part of your Gradle build, which Gradle, Gradle has a, there's a plugin for, and uh, and it's pretty extensible, so you can do pretty much anything before before a certain task in Gradle. Um, you're going to want to mock or stub your third-party services. So, uh, if your if your app calls other APIs, um, you obviously don't want to be calling those APIs in uh, as part of your build. But you want to you want to make sure that they um, that they are working uh, that that your application is behaving as you'd expect. And the nice thing about a good mocking library is you can kind of, uh, with, with APIs, is that you can um, simulate various scenarios where your third-party APIs are down or they're returning bad data or whatnot, and you can test to see how your application responds. Um, and Betamax and Mock Server are two libraries that help you do that. Um, my, my group at my client has a pretty cool homegrown thing where you use Spock style mocks uh, and I'm trying to get them to open source it. It's, it's really helpful. Um, and then email, you also, you know, that's an, another example. Um, you know, email or cache or any third party service, you want your application, you don't want to just turn off a feature for your build. You don't want to say, oh, we're just not going to send email as part of our application and part of our testing. You want to include, you want to have test your code as much as possible. And so um, ideally you've got a way, GreenMail is a library that lets you start up a local email server. And, uh, and then when you, when you run your test, you can assert, okay, I've, you know, I've got, I got an email that was sent. Um, so anything, anything like that. Um, 
and then packaging. Um, uh, at the end of your build, you want to produce an artifact that can then go out to each environment. Um, ideally, it's the same environment or the same artifact that goes to every environment. So you, you have the same Docker container or the same uh, war file or the same uh, fat jar, um, whatever. And then you externalize the configuration somehow um, so that you're able to you're able to take that same war and make it point at the right servers. Um, uh, so may, maybe that's a, some system properties you set or some files on the file system. Uh, Spring Boot's got a pretty mature um, uh, strategy for just having a, a sensible default for, for externalizing configuration. Um, I usually try to include most of the config, and this is just properties files. Usually it's just like base URLs, but um, I usually try to keep most of the config inside of my app, but then I have like a minus D spring profiles active on the, on the system properties um, just to limit the, the amount of, uh, of external uh, things that we have to maintain. Um, but you know, I, you'll have, you'll have different needs depending on where you are. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, and then, uh, then you archive those artifacts. So you'll, you'll want some sort of version. Um, and versioning is kind of up to you. I usually, uh, lately, have just kind of gone away from the whole Maven style of release process where you have a commit that changes your, prop, your version to a snapshot. And then you know, when you want to release it, it commits a change to make it a, a release version and commits a change to make it a snapshot version again. Uh, I just find that that kind of clutters up the the source history when you're when you're releasing a lot. Um, so really, what we do is uh, we just have um, every build uh, we specify in the command line with Gradle a minus p version equals 1.0. build number, uh, and that build number comes from Jenkins, um, and it just increments it each time, and we have a new release. Um, we haven't had to, any trouble with storage or anything yet. Uh, even snapshots can cause a lot of use a lot of storage those. I mean, if you're publishing a lot of snapshots. So that's up to you. I think everybody's gonna have a different a different use case or for how they want to version it. Um, maybe you know you could have a timestamp for your non-released versions, but if you decide, okay, this is something I want to push through the pipeline as a as a release, you could, you know, have another uh, another flag you specify in the command line that just uses the build number or whatever. Uh, and the other thing is that the artifact name uh, with Gradle, the artifact name comes from your directory by default. So depending if you have a developer that checks out their directories with different names from Git, um, you're going to, uh, it, it would potentially introduce a problem. So just remember you can set the root project dot name in the settings.gradle. So I'll just show a little demo of what Gradle looks like. Um, uh, Tell you. Anybody here using Gradle? Okay. Um, so Gradle's got um, kind of a negative is that it, it, there's a lot of files in the root of your repository sometimes, and it, it can be kind of frustrating if you don't know what they all do. So I'll kind of go through through those really quickly. Um, you've got a, uh, at the root, at the base of your project, you've got the build.gradle, which is a, a DSL. It's written in Groovy, um, and it allows you to define uh, define your build and and what it, what it needs to build and, and everything. And um, it, it the plugins that it provides, it's kind of a, if you think about Ant as, the raw power of you can pretty much run anything you want in Ant, uh, but it's very unstructured, and you can do, you know it's it, it, a lot of things broke down because nobody used the same conventions in Ant. And then Maven is um, also XML configuration, but they've got a very specific set of plugins and a very spe uh, normal way of doing things that everybody's kind of locked in to to doing everything together, unless you write your own Maven plugin. Um, Gradle kind of 
takes that structure from Maven. There's a lot of plugins that are uh, that are uh, that can be used to reduce to make it so you don't have to write custom build logic. But if you need to, you can uh, drop out of those plugins and you can write your own uh, groovy code to to uh, do do what you need. Um, and uh, and then if you need to, you can actually package that up as a plugin itself. It's um, but uh, with uh, with with the Gradle uh, build. First, it's going to look for dependencies for the build script, and that would be plugins and other other libraries that it needs to build to build the project. Not actually not actually compile time dependencies, but plugin dependencies. Um, so this first script, I'm specifying the Spring Boot Gradle plugin, um, and then I'm applying these plugins, and um, then we've got the repositories and dependencies for. Uh, uh, for actually building our project. So these are the dependencies I need. Uh, and then I, I threw the upload archives is the repository for where you would publish your project. I just have it be a flat, had it be a flat directory in my, in my file system. Uh, uh, it's so that we can just uh, publish it there, but normally it would be Nexus or Artifactory. Um, so the build.gradle is um, is pretty straightforward. It can get long if you add a lot of dependencies or a lot of sub-projects. The nice thing is you can break it out. If you have sub-modules, you can break it out to multiple build.gradle files. Um, Gradle.properties allows you to just specify some default properties for your application on the in, in a Java properties format. Um, and you'll notice here I just have a version of 0-snapshot, mostly because I don't want to keep the actual version as part of source control, I don't want those commits coming in and potentially and and changing, you know, adding commits to my source history all the time. Um, Gradle W is the command line script that runs that will download Gradle and run it. Um, it's Linux or Unix and uh, and Windows versions here. Um, Settings.gradle. Uh, this is where you define your root project name and also your submodules. Um, if you have if you have submodules, um, this is this is evaluated before build.gradle, um, which, which is I think why it's a separate uh, separate file. Um, and then there's the Gradle directory, which contains the Gradle wrapper <laughs> jar and properties, and the uh, the build directory, which is the output, the the you know jars and classes and everything that your build builds, and then the dot gradle um, directory, which is like local caches. Um, so you wouldn't you wouldn't check in the dot gradle directory or the build directory. And so I have those I have those ignored in my uh, in my dot git ignore um, file. Um, so we can. Uh, we can I'm in presentation mode, and I'm not I'm not used to that tool windows. Um, so we can run this build just by I can clean it first, or I can just run Gradle W build. And whether if I have if I don't have this version of Gradle, it will. Um, it will uh, download it for me, and then it will build it. And Gradle's pretty good at um, caching and up-to-date checking. If you don't make changes on something, it will just go through it quicker, and the build's pretty successful. Um, if I clean it first, um, you know, it might take 10 or 15 seconds. Um, this is a pretty simple application. Uh, I just uh, I had to know. Uh, I needed something that would tell me every morning. Um, well, I'll uh, I'll open up the application and um, is it warmer in Cancun? And the answer is yes, it's warmer in Cancun right now. Uh, we I was in Cancun about a year ago, and I think it was a hundred 
degrees difference from uh, between Minneapolis and Can and Cancun uh, when we when we landed. Um, the difference actually isn't that big today. It's pretty warm outside right now. Um, but this is just a simple application I wanted to throw together because it's got an external API it connects to. It's the open weather map. And I, I, can, I can write a test that hits this endpoint. And um, most of the time, it's probably going to say, is it warmer in Cancun? Yes. But uh, what about maybe some day in July where you know, they, they're having a cold spell down there? I don't know. Uh, it's pr it would probably never say it's warmer in Cancun. But we want to be able to appropriately uh, test out this third-party API um, without, without the potential of it breaking the build. Uh, and so we, we'll, uh, we stub the, stub the third-party services. Um, we also want to, uh, it, you know, if my API key expired or, or whatnot, it, I don't want that to be part of my build. Or, or if um, I don't want my build to be counting against, uh, against my quota limits. Um, against the production service. So uh, it, if I, I think there's not a great reason to ever hit, hit the real services during your build. Um, at some point, you probably need some tests that test in an integrated environment with, um, against real services, and that would be a separate set of tests that don't run as part of your build. They would run as part of your, as part of your pipeline. But... Uh, but in, 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 for your build, to get that artifact, you want to, you have to make some assumptions about your service and, and you need a repeatable, uh, a, a reliable um, uh, environment for it to run in. So in this case, I didn't even have to uh, uh, boot run as a, um, a, a Gradle task provided by the Spring Boot plugin. Um, but uh, I was able to write uh, Spring Boot provides a um, an annotation called Web Integration Test, which will start up the application with Tomcat, and uh, and um, I gave it a profile build, um, which I'll show you in a minute uh, to override some properties. But then I was able to just write a simple test here that um, that kind of I have a I have a stub. That, that I've configured, and this is kind of a poor man's mock API. Um, but I, I didn't want uh, to tie anybody down to any um, specific, or wor to get people worried about the specific implementation. So I just created for the, for it during the test, during the test case, there's a stub controller in there that, um, that it will use. And I was just able to kind of configure that stub, run my test. And, uh, and, and assert that the results are what I expect. And then I was able to you know, provide the, the unbelievable scenario um, there. And then I, there's also an API endpoint that you know, I was able to test. Um, and this is actually going through against a running application. Um, if, uh, depending on what you know, framework you're using, you may not have an annotation like this. Um, web integration test uh, on that Spring Spring Boot provides, um, but uh, but e Gradle makes it really simple. If you want to, um, uh, if you want to start up a Tom a Tomcat instance as part of like a functional test test phase, and and you start up that Tomcat or Jetty or or whatever your application is, and uh, and you can run run your functional test against that and then it will shut it down at the end of the phase. Um, I just took the easy way out here because Spring Boot, Spring Boot provides so much out of the box. Um, so that's my suggestion for how, how to get started with continuous delivery on Gradle. Um, I uh, I think uh, there, there's a lot that could be said on, on continuous delivery, and there's a lot that could be said on, on Gradle, and um, hopefully I, I help give everybody some good ideas. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes? You said Gradle will still use wrapper. Yep. Everything from the internet. So what if you're in an organization that's concerned about downloading stuff from the internet? Uh, 
Can they easily mirror it or specify a trusted source? Yep. So um, there's a uh, when you're initializing a project, a Gradle project, um, it will create the wrapper for you, um, but it's really easily configurable. Uh, in this Gradle wrapper, Gradle wrapper properties, there's just a distribution URL, and you can have that pointed at. Um, if I'm guessing that your organization has some sort of artifact repository like Nexus or um, where, where the third-party dependencies could be downloaded from, you can you would you would probably just put this Gradle zip in in that repository. That's a good question. Anything else? Did you say you use a CI server, and how did you incorporate if that get too broad out of your? I don't. I don't mind. Um, so I use the CI server to. I use Jenkins. Um, in in uh, every project's going to be different, but I basically just had a, a what I called a pipeline job, and I just kind of numbered them. But I had one job that was just looking for looking for changes um, to to the master branch, and when that kicked off, it kicked off a second job, which actually built the project. Um, and it and it gave it passed in the version based on the build number, and it um, and then after that version was built, it, the the pipeline job would kick off some simple jobs that would just copy the war up to a QA environment and um, and deploy it there. Um, and that's as far as our continuous deployment with continu with continuous integration went. Um, but uh, it it pretty much was the same. Um, so what it what it looks like, I didn't show you the upload archives here. Um, you would just set up Jenkins to. Um, you'd probably want to do a clean because that's usually a good idea in uh, in CI. Um, you would do a build and then you do an upload archives. Action, um, and then you would specify. You know, we commit a lot to this project, so we're going to have um, twenty-one thousand four hundred and ninety-eight uh, on there, um, and so that's uh, that's going to build it. Um, and then the upload archives just takes that artifact that it built and and deploys it to your repository um, with that version. So that's how we did it. Um, some teams prefer still to have the snapshot versions or. Um, it's kind of up to up to you, I think. So, and then that upload archives because I configured this with a local distribution, which I don't know why you would ever really need that. But um, in slash temp slash repo, I've got this uh, continuous Gradle dash one dot oh dot twenty one four ninety eight dot jar, which is a fat jar, um, and so that's nice. It gives us a versioned artifact that says. This applies. This um, this is the version uh, of the application that we're testing. We're pushing it out, and I've got and in my build script here, I've got a. Um, I'm taking that jar, uh, taking that version, and I'm processing it, filtering it into uh, our resources, a, a source main resources. Um, so I'm able to put that app version in in a properties file. And then, uh, not to get too deep into um, into Spring Boot again, but I've got the um, I've got the Spring Boot actuator, which provides a bunch of uh, like kind of production ready endpoints. And um, uh oh, well, I guess I broke it. Um, really? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I, I just found a hole in my process. Um, so I'll fix that before you guys all check out this repo. Uh, but uh, th that, that, that's given us, that, that gives my team a lot of visibility into what version is where and you know, how, those, how healthy that environment is. Yeah? Uh, I think um, Gradle that 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 repository that it configured um, that was configured in the build.gradle is 
technically an IV repository um, when you say flat, flat dir. Um, and so Gradle created those IV.xml files in that slash temp slash repo. Um, uh, normally it would look like, I think what we do is it looks something like this, like Maven repo, and then you'd have a URL and a username and password, um, or a, you would specify the username and password on a command line probably. Um, but, uh, I think the flat dir just in Gradle's, uh, terms just publishes an IV repository by default. So I didn't, I didn't really want to spend a lot of time working on, on publishing to some external repository there because that's going to be different for everybody and whoever checked it out wouldn't have my credentials to publish anyways. So, um, there's, if you don't have, if you don't have a Nexus or Artifactory repository or something in your, in your team, there's, um, uh, there's, uh, J, JFrog or Bintray has a great uh, software as a service option. Um, there's also examples out there of using the Amazon S3 if you want to roll your own and just um, and just have it publish the artifact to um, to S3 and then you can pull it down from wherever. It really depends on what you need. Um, yeah, how big your company is. Anything else? Cool. Well, um, I'll be around for questions and whatever to, uh, to talk. Um, if you want to learn more, um, I've got, I'll leave this screen up. Um, I've got a repository on GitHub uh, that you can download this or check this out from and try running it yourself. You can email me. Um, and if you want to learn about continuous delivery and just get a lot of good ideas, uh, the continuous delivery book by Jez Humble and David Farley is really awesome. It's huge. It's like, it's a big book, but, and, and it's, it's maybe five years old, I think. Uh, but it, I feel like it's the, the test of time and really has a lot of non-technology specific, um, uh, uh, examples and, um, and solutions in there that will help you uh, do continuous delivery. But that will get into also, that'll get into like database migrations from a continuous delivery perspective. Like how do you, how do you change the name of a column in a database with zero downtime and, um, and keeping, you know, your application running with uh, 5 million users or whatever, you know, they, they've got a lot of great content in there and, uh, and I'd recommend reading that. So great. Thank you.